Well, it's great to be here with you, Lucy and uh, Jamie. Um, but I love glass because it's, you know, in terms of wine, it's inert, impermeable and yet transparent. So it does a fantastic job. But I want to jump in right at the beginning on the idea, Lucy, about glass being infinitely recyclable, part of a, a closed loop. Can you just expand on that for us? So you might have heard the phrase circular economy, which is bandied around a lot. I use the phrase real circular economy because at the moment, a lot of that um, energy is going into materials that can maybe re be collected and recycled once. But then what happens after that? And I would say that's semi-circular in a way. Well, I, I think this is interesting that we've never really had this conversation before. We've just taken glass for granted a little bit. Um, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, it's glass, you know, it's just glass. But it's like, dude, this is actually like um, pretty cool. Um, and it's because of this, this, these glass bottles that we have the, 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 I hate to use the term industry, but the wine industry that we have now has evolved largely on the back of the fact that uh, of the, the physical properties of glass. So it's not just about the material and whether it can be recycled again and again and again, though that needs to be part of it. And thankfully, glass is very helpful. It is also about can we set up the systems to make that happen? With that in mind as well, look, thinking ahead uh, as to observing kind of our behaviour as a, as a nation, you know, one of the things I've noticed in my lifetime, my, my grandmother, for example, in Bournemouth had a little, it was basically a little cupboard off the kitchen that she called a larder, that's, that's being a bit grand, it was a cupboard really. But it was absolutely full of reused glass bottles that she would just fill with produce that she created and tinctured and made these potions from her very small garden. But they were all very thriftily made, they were all things that endured through the seasons. And I just wonder, there's that, shit. it seems there's been a change since that time yeah. in my childhood looking at uh, the way in which she regarded it's the value all, of It's not just about the material and the properties of the material, it's culturally knowing what to do and having confidence that you can deposit that material somewhere. So I grew up, you know, in suburban areas where there was always a bottle bank. And I don't know if it's true or not, but my granddad used to say to me, if you take the bottles and put them in the bottle bank on a certain day, if someone from the local paper is there, the photographer, and takes your picture, you'll get 10 pounds. <laughs> that could have been complete fiction. So you've got immediately all of these elements that start to make the likelihood of returning that material quite high, culturally embedded. And then, of course, you've got the properties of the material and how it's made and the whole kind of history and process using glass colour in recycling. And you, you have all the elements that you need for the jigsaw that makes up real circularity, not semi-circularity. We have to be really careful not to um, reinvent the wheel for the sake of it. But we often have very over-engineered solutions presented to us for something that we already have. And for me, it's a bit like stick or twist. And I'm talking about our market in the UK. Uh, you know, it, I, if, if a solution for a wine holder, wine packaging is presented to me that can save um, a, a small amount of carbon, I immediately ask myself, yes, but does it fit into the system, the imperfect system? And will consumers, and consumers are citizens, I prefer to talk about us as citizens, will they get it and understand it? Or will it confuse them? Jamie, I'm just wondering from the point of view of um, the weight of glass, you know, it can be perceived as heavy, but I think the wine trade has been moving fairly steadily towards lighter glass. Look, it's, it's a really... Um important move because the carbon footprint of moving you know packaged wines once they were in bottle is quite significant glass is heavy and and significant um, savings and weight have been achieved and also with sparkling wine bottles because the challenge there is that with um, champagne and sparkling wine when it's been fermented in the bottle you've got six bars of pressure so you need strong glass for that so Designing a bottle that's light and strong has been quite a technical challenge. You know, the remarkable thing about glass is it's completely inert and um, it's very stable. And with wine, what you've got is a, a liquid that's got relatively high acidity and also it's got alcohol in it, which is a solvent. So many other containers, you know, you'd have some chemical interaction between the wine and the surface of the container. And the thing about glass is because it's inert um, and it's um, not going to react at all, um, you can keep 
potentially keep the wine in a bottle for a very long time, which has opened up a whole new dimension of wine. And I think the culture of having wine in bottles has almost become intrinsic to wine itself. We talk about bottle of wine, it's a second nature. Mm. And, and by dint of the natural composition of glass, you know, it, it, and it's obviously inert, it, it allows those miraculous changes in flavour and aroma to occur, you know, in, in a way that I, every wine lover just adores, you know, the, the journey that a wine takes in the bottle is, yeah. has a profound impact on it. And, you know, that's a huge yeah. part of my love of wine for sure. You know, I'm a real believer in having a, a coherence between the wine and the packaging so that the two of them really um, have, a, have a sense that, that this is the right packaging for that wine. And when it's done well and when the right bottle is used and the, and the right label is used um, and you've got a concordance between the nature of the wine and the nature of the packaging, I think that's quite powerful. I think um, for, for most people, the way the wine looks really matters and it doesn't just influence purchasing decisions. I think it actually shapes our perception of the wine as well. A crisp, fresh, have momsy a Madeira. Have a little of cheese and think of it as liquid chutney. Um, but I, I love the style of wine because it's exactly what you were talking about, Jamie. The, the, the concordance between what's in the bottle, the quality level and the glass. And actually one of my favorite wine places to visit is Madeira. And I love going into some of the old cellars, for example, at Blandy's, which is where this one's from, the 10 year old. Um, and they've got bottles in there, in their library, that stretch back hundreds of years. I think I've seen one in there from like the 1700s. And they've got the kind of stenciling on the bottles. Yeah. We know that the stuff inside the bottles already oxidized, so it's pretty bulletproof. It will endure forever. So it's been kept in pristine order, thanks to the glass. But the other thing I love is once you open it, because it's indestructible, you get a free decanter. And you can have a you can have a little yeah. tipple of this every night for a year, and the wine would pretty much taste the same. And that is why I love Madeira, and I love it served in a glass bottle.